Please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Pastor, I thought we were having a Bible study out of Philippians. We are. But we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a very familiar verse, and that would be verse number 58. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. I'm glad all of you are here tonight. Thank you. What a beautiful day it has been here at Timberline. I wish everybody could experience Colorado beautiful days. And we've had a beautiful one here today for sure. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. I want you to read with me, please, out loud, everyone now. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And our Heavenly Father, please, all I ask, and it is my only request, is that you meet with us tonight. Without you, we'll go home completely empty. And I ask you to meet with us, please, not only for our sake, but for your own, so that we can grow in our faith. For you have said, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. And of course, you may be seated. Continuing in our Philippian doctrinal study, which is what we are doing right now, continuing alphabetically uh, through uh, the doctrines that are found throughout the book of Philippians, we now come to the doctrine of labor, the doctrine of labor. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we had the doctrine of Jesus in the book of Philippians. Last week, we had the doctrine of joy found in the book of Philippians. And tonight, we have the doctrine of labor in the book of Philippians. Now, I want to remind all those online, and of course my church family knows this, but we're not really venturing to any place else in the Bible to learn the doctrine, because the Bible's filled with this particular subject. But we are sticking to the book of Philippians. And so, very tonight I believe will help all of us, and by the way, it's a wonderful thing to labor for the Lord. I don't know any other way to say that. It's a wonderful thing to labor for the cause of Christ. And by the way, being busy does not equal labor for the Lord, especially for the Lord. And some believers are so consumed, and I put this in our bulletin this last Sunday, but some believers are so consumed looking for sinners on the inside that they have forgotten to seek them on the outside. And they're just being busy, but they're not being busy serving or laboring for the Lord. Uh, there Maybe they're busy bodies. Maybe that would be a way to put it. And the truth of the matter is, I remember years ago, and I guess I was just a young boy, but I remember someone said that your freedom ends where my nose begins. I thought that was pretty good. So you keep your nose out of other people's business personally and and quit nosing around. And that's just busy work. And often it is just busy and critical work. Now, I do want you to take your Bible and I want you to look at something else before I get into the book of Philippians. And that is Luke chapter 19. You'll recognize the verses. Some of you may even have them memorized at this point. But Luke chapter 19, verses 12 and 13, we find the beginning of a parable. And notice these words. It says, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Key phrase. In fact, a very important phrase that we need to know about. In other words, what Jesus was saying in this parable, you do the work or the labor of the master until he returns. That's what we're supposed to do. Stay busy serving the Lord. And that's what this is all about. You stay busy serving the Lord. People get lazy. They stop serving. They stop laboring for the Lord. They get busy in other things. Uh, my pastor taught me years ago that soldiers that uh, don't go to battle end up fighting one another in the dorms or in the uh, places where they slept. And I think that's very, very true. If they're not busy doing the work of a soldier, they get to working on each other and they hurt each other. And in our churches today, we have many who are busybodies and get, not getting along with anybody in the church. They're also not out there serving the Lord either. They're not laboring on his behalf. 
So they find criticism and they find, uh, they find uh, backbiting and they find all these things to fight one another within a church when they need to quit doing that and fight the enemy on the outside of the church. And I think it's interesting that God said in his word that we, the gates of hell, will not prevail against the local church. And I have said over and over again, the local church will never be destroyed by the devil on the outside. It will be destroyed by people on the inside. But people that aren't serving the Lord are busy destroying it on the inside. And so the admonition is given to each one of us as believers. We are to do his work and accomplish his business and occupy till he comes back for every one of us at the rapture. And so this kind of labor is what we're talking about in the book of Philippians. Laboring for the Lord, you see. Not just being busybodies and not just taking up space. Not taking up our so many inches in our pew or sitting there or getting busy uh, doing other things. We need to be serving the Lord. So the doctrine of labor is only covered by a few verses in the book of Philippians, and I have some lessons that I want to share with you tonight. So let's go to chapter 1, and many of you are marking these in your Bible, and I appreciate that very, very much. But let's look at the doctrine of labor, labor chapter 1, chapter 1 and verse 22. I'll give you a moment to get there. Philippians 1 and verse 22, where the Bible says, But if I live in the flesh... This is the fruit of my labor, yet what shall I choose, I wot not. So there you have the first time labor is mentioned by, by name in the book of Philippians. Now turn over to chapter 2. There are three verses there that I want to share with you. Philippians, first of all, chapter 2 and verse 16. Philippians 2.16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. In other words, there's labor people can do that is vain. The Bible tells us that. And then chapter 2 and verse 25. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Philippians 2.25 And then the last one in chapter 2 is chapter 2 and verse 30, where it talks here again about Epaphroditus, though his name is not mentioned in this verse. That is the context that is there. And by the way, this really speaks to me personally. With so many people looking for any excuse to not be in church, looking for any excuse to skip, looking for any excuse not to be present, looking for any excuse to forsake the assembling together. And yes, they are out there. This verse inspires me about Epaphroditus. It says, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. So Epaphroditus was a very sacrificial individual. And I'll say more about that in a moment. And then one last reference in the book of Philippians, chapter 4 and verse 3. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Et all, that is all the verses in the book of Philippians that speak directly of service or of labor of some kind. And what I did was I have written down some important lessons that I want us to catch tonight from the verses that are here. Now, remember my challenge a while back was you can go through this book and you can find them. I mean, I'll announce next week's um, next week's doctrine, and you're welcome to go through the book of Philippians on your own and find each reference to it, and uh, I have it down here, and I think that it'll be easy for you. But all I did to find these 40 doctrines as I went through the book, found the teaching, wrote it down, and then wrote lessons. Now, here's what you could do. For example, I know that many people don't want to ever speak in front of anybody, but one of these days, somebody's going to say to you, 
you know, would you bring a devotion at a shower? Would you bring a devotion at a uh, at a meeting? Would you bring a devotion for this? And our first thought is, what would I say? What can I say? Well, if you were to go through the book of Philippians and find a single subject and trace it through the entire book, you would have an entire outline in front of you. And all you have to do is read it and quote it and comment on it. And you've got the devotion done. Uh, I remember Dr. Hiles used to say that when he first started preaching, he'd read a verse and holler, read a verse and holler, read a verse and holler. Well, you don't have to holler but you can find the same things that I found. And by the way, I, like I said, I found 40, and I'm sure there are more, but I found 40 in the four little chapters of Philippians. Lesson number one. If we labor in the flesh alone, we have no reward. If we labor in the flesh alone, we have no reward. Philippians chapter one and verse 22 says, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. And there's much work today that is done in the power of the flesh. I have mentioned time and time again, uh, uh, the pianist should never go to the piano having not prayed for the power of the spirit. The organist should never go to the organ without having prayed for the power of the Holy Spirit. An usher should never ush without asking God to help them to ush in the power of the spirit. A sound man should never do work the sound without asking for God's help and God's power. Those who labor here at the church and volunteer their time, if you labor in your flesh, I'll guarantee you, you'll get tired of the work rather than getting tired in it. And it's okay to get tired in the work of the Lord. I just want to say that again. It's okay to get tired in the work of the Lord. But when you get tired of it, something's wrong somewhere. Today there are many, and I'll, I'll probably catch it for this, for saying it. But today there are many burnout camps for pastors and Christian workers. Now, I just want to say I'm not a believer in a burnout camp. I do believe pastors need to get away. I do believe workers need to find time alone to rejuvenate. But when a pastor or a worker gets tired of the work, they feel like they've got to take a sabbatical so they can get geared back up. And there is a difference. The truth of the matter is the Bible doesn't speak of that. It speaks of coming apart to pray. And I've often said you need to come apart lest you fall apart. And I believe that. But that doesn't mean to take maybe months at a time. And I'm not saying that is necessarily sin. What I'm saying is we get our strength from the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Serving the Lord is what we're supposed to do. And so uh, the Apostle Paul writes here and says very plainly, if I do the work of the Lord in the flesh, then there's just no reward there. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll not go there. But what does 1 Corinthians 13 chapter 13 say? It says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have this and have that and give my body to be burned and sacrifice everything that I have and have not charity. He said, I am become a, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. He said, in other words, it is just absolutely empty what I'm doing. Well, I think we need to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit and, and labor for the Lord. That's my first lesson, is if we labor in the flesh alone, we have no reward. Lesson number two that I wrote down. If we work at spreading the gospel, when we get to heaven, we can say our work was not, our, our work was not in vain. Let me say it again. If we work at spreading the gospel, when we get to heaven, we can say that our work was not in vain. Now, we can say that because that's what God says. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. The ministry of the word of God. Listen, there's so many ways to minister the word of God. And that one way is to get gospel tracts and hand them out. I mean, look. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you gave a tract to anybody? Or a personal witness, or knocking on a door, or speaking with someone, or even witnessing to a, a waitress or a waiter at a restaurant and telling them that Jesus loves them. I remember Randy Casey telling the story, and I love Randy Casey's stories. But I remember he said the waitress came to their table, and he looked up at the waitress. He says, has anybody told you they love you today? Well, he was old enough to say that and get away with it, okay? 
and she broke down and cried when he told her that Jesus loved her. Her heart was so filled with with disappointment and hurt and discouragement, and his words were encouraging to her. For God so loved the world, you see, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, the Bible says. And so he sat, that she sat down and wept with him for a while as a waitress, and he got to share the gospel with her. Listen, your labor is not in vain when you're spreading the gospel to someone. Think about that. And But the average Christian today never one time in a month of Sundays spreads the gospel to anybody ever. And that's our, the Bible says that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so, so important that we're just, and all you, if all you can do is pass out a gospel track, then pass out a gospel track. When Brother Penn and I were down in Argentina, we had to stay in Buenos Aires for one night. And I remember we went out and we went to a restaurant and we're going to eat and we had to walk everywhere we went. We didn't want to necessarily take a, a taxi anywhere. And we would walk by a couple of places and there were men standing out front handing out flyers to everybody that came by. Everybody that came by got one. Everybody gets one. Well, they handed us one and it was pornography. It was an advertise. It didn't have pictures, but it was an advertisement for pornography that was inside the building that they were in front of. And I remember that I said back to the individual, I said, Diablo, Diablo, Fierro, talk about hellfire and the devil. We asked a guy one night, I said, why are you passing this out? You're a family man. He said, it's my only source of income. I get to thinking, you know, he's standing out there passing out advertisement for pornography. Why can't Christians stand there and pass out gospel tracts? Lady in our church many years ago, Mrs. Pruitt, got outside of City Market up in Woodland Park, and she just said, everybody gets one, and she's just handed tracts to everybody that came in and out of the store. Oh, they were all over the parking lot, but she did that. And the truth of the matter is, you can do that too. I think every Christian ought to make it a goal that you're going to pass out so many gospel tracts in a single week. Take, I say, I'm going to take five gospel tracts and I'm going to pass out to five people. Or I'm going to take ten and I'm going to pass it out to ten people. And uh, make it a goal and then make another goal the next week. If we work at spreading the gospel, when we get to heaven, we can say that our work was not in vain. We did not labor in vain. Third lesson is this. One who works in and for the same cause with you, namely the gospel, is called a true companion, is called a true companion. You know, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. Why? Because it was important that there was somebody with them. If one person started to fail, then the other person could could step in. And they were there to encourage one another. And I learned that even as a teenager. We would work on our bus routes and we'd go soul winning uh, with a partner. Listen to these verses here, if you would please. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor. What an incredible statement. Epaphroditus was my companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger that he ministered, that he that ministered to my wants. So we have here Epaphroditus. He was a co-laborer with the Apostle Paul. I think one of the hardest things in ministry today is for anyone to feel as though they are all alone serving the Lord. All alone serving the Lord. Uh, I, re, I Listen, there's so many people that say, well, I would be a witness if somebody would go with me, or I would serve the Lord if I had somebody that would stand by my side, or whatever it might be. But today there are so many that have nobody, and they feel all alone. Does that mean they should stop serving the Lord? No, not at all. But it's a lot easier when you find out that Jesus sent them out two by two. There's logic in that biblical logic. Now, Philippians chapter four and verse three, it says, and I entreat thee also true yoke fellow. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel and Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. I think this is interesting. Uh, I remember years ago, my dad always remember this because he went to a Sword of the Lord convention in Indianapolis, Indiana. In 1974 is the year that he referenced. And he remembered uh, Jack Hiles giving uh, a lesson on working together in the ministry. He said, the ministry is divided like a pie. He said, the pie as a whole, it's everything that needs to be done. 
says one person might have this piece of the pie, another person might have this piece of the pie, another person this piece of the pie, and he went on down through it. And he says, and all of them working together make up an entire pie. And I thought it was a good illustration. Uh, one person preaches, uh, one person teaches, one person plays, one person sings, uh, one person cleans, one person drives, one person does this. And all of these together make up the ministry in a whole. I remember uh, that there are so many today that there are no volunteers in churches to do anything. Why? They're too busy doing other things. They're busy. But they have, there's responsibilities within a local church. And the pie goes without people helping out. You think about that. If one person in this church, as small as our church is, if one person had to do it all, can you imagine? Sometimes it is one person doing most of it. But sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's others, and all the rest of it. Do you remember vacation Bible time in this church? Remember how on my left over here would have all the people that volunteered that fill up half the auditorium. And then on this side, it remained empty because we would go through a work list of people and jobs that needed to be done. Games that needed somebody to do the games, somebody to clean up, somebody to do this, somebody to do that. And we assigned from everybody on this side of the church, ended up going to this side of the church, and everybody had their part of the pie to accomplish Boy, those were really great days, weren't they? You think about that. And I've got pictures of vacation Bible time of people sitting out here uh, serving popsicles and cookies and uh, the, the, the jail that we had out there the, and all that. And then other people standing there with uh, squirt guns for the kids and another person throwing a softball and all the rest of it. And everybody just having a good time serving the Lord together. One person could not do it all. There is no way. And so we're talking about those uh, who work in and for the same cause with you, namely the gospel, is called a true companion. And we get it all done together. How many times have I said over these decades in this church, we're a team. That's what we are. We're a team. And we each do our part to the best of our ability and not shirk our responsibilities. Why? Because we are a team. That's for sure. The last lesson that I wrote down was this. Labor for the Lord many times involves sickness and perhaps even death. I don't know of anybody that wants to die right now serving the Lord like the little boy that was standing in the back of the auditorium with the pastor of a church, and they were looking at these different names that were on the wall. And the little boy asked the pastor, who, who are these people? Who are these names? And the pastor looked at the little boy and said, those are people who died in the service. The little boy got real quiet. And he looked at the pastor and said, was that the morning service or the evening service? <laughs> of all things. I know it's an old joke. I laugh at it every time I hear it. I love it. But you know, sometimes... You get sick, and sometimes you just got to do your job. I've had people ask me, says, why do you do this? It's because it has to be done. And sometimes if you don't do it, it's simply not going to get done. The Bible says in Philippians 4 and verse 3, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Not only that, but I think about what it says about Epaphroditus, where the Bible speak of him, spoke of him, and said that he worked so hard serving the Lord that he was even came sick and even nigh unto death of all things as they served the Lord. And you know, like I said earlier, there are so many today, and I'm not saying that you got to come to church and you've got a fever of 105 and you're contagious and, and or you got red spots all over your body and you're going to end up infecting someone or you got COVID real bad and you're going to cough on somebody. I don't mean that. But today there are people that are looking for the least excuse not to serve the Lord. Like the man who used to sit right back here who said one day to me uh, on the phone, I won't be in church tonight because I have a touch of the flu. I still don't know what that is. A touch of the flu? Was that a slight fever? Was that a little bit of uh, stomach upset? Was that an intestinal problem? What was it? Never knew. But that individual also lost his dedication to serving the Lord as well. Looked for every excuse not to be here. 
Now, what I'm saying with all of us right now, when I think about Epaphroditus, and I, I said how he encourages me and how he absolutely inspires me, when I think about how he kept serving the Lord, even though he didn't feel good. And I here's what I do. And this is not an inspiration to you, and I don't want anybody to judge me by saying, oh, you're making yourself some kind of a, a, of a go-getter leader or whatever. But listen, there's a lot of times that I don't feel good, and I come anyway, and I preach anyway. Do I tell anybody? Not a soul. I don't tell a soul. There are some people, I mean, if they feel bad, they're going to let everybody know how bad they feel right then and there. This is how bad it is. No, and I'll never tell you if I feel bad or if I'm not feeling well. Now, if I'm contagious, I won't be here, but that's different. What I'm saying is you look for things to do to serve the Lord, and you don't give an excuse about why you can't. Oh, it's so very, very important. So very, very important that we can keep on serving the Lord. Uh, you wake up tired. I don't know. Everybody in this room woke up tired today. Everybody did. And you're going to go to bed tired tonight. And you're going to get home after church tonight and do what I do. I'll put my feet up tonight because I'm tired right now. And I'll put my feet up when I go home and I'll get me something to eat because I've not had dinner yet or supper yet, I should say. And, uh, and I'll get a little bit of something to eat and I'll go home and put my feet up. I don't make any bones about it. That's what I'm going to do. And, uh, but sometimes I'm tired and you just have to keep on going no matter what and do the best you can. Now, I want to say this. Labor for the Lord is not empty. It's not vain. Serving the Lord. I was taught when I was in Bible college that God's business is the greatest business in all the world. And the Bible says, what thy hand findeth to do, you do it with your might. But see, the labor for the Lord is not empty, idle work, but it's profitable and rewarding to all who will serve the Lord in that way. And sometimes people nearly work themselves to death for the cause of Christ. One missionary died in his early 30s as he spent time on his knees in the snow praying for the people he was ministering to. They say that's a great Christian who did that, and I believe that probably he was, but I wonder how much more he could have served the Lord if he would have lived to 50 or 60 years of age rather than dying in his 30s because he didn't take care of his health. You see, sometimes there's a fine line between faith and foolishness sometimes. Labor is never really easy, so it's always good to have a companion to work with you, somebody you can pray with, somebody that you can have with you. Somebody, I'll say to you sometimes, listen, somebody visits our church, go sit with them. Don't let them sit by themselves. Uh, invite people to come, have them sit with you. Say, come up and sit with me in church. I want you to sit with me. And in labor with the Lord, you see how important that is. And so that's my lessons tonight on the labor, the word labor that is found in the book of Philippians. Now, for those of you who are doing this, uh, the next one we're going to look at is the doctrine of life, L-I-F-E. And so if you're going to go through Philippians, there's only four chapters. You read a few verses a day, get through it by the next Wednesday night. You'll probably, you will find every verse that mentions life and probably think of lessons that come with every one of those verses. And so that's what I would encourage you to do. Now, remember, I said that I give you an idea of what you can do, but I'll never quiz you on it. I'll never ask you if you're doing it. I'll never ask you what you found. If you share that with me, that's different. But I'll never ask you. I just give you a suggestion. It's just a short book. It's not like you're reading through Revelation and looking up everything that has to do with light. Okay, we're talking about four short chapters in the book of Philippians. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, let's be standing to our feet and we will have a closing word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the beautiful doctrine of labor.